Good morning, Norwood. Good to be here today in the nice humid weather. It's, that's the one thing that's been. Uh, uh, did, did, how many here heard all the uh, were part of the thunderstorms yesterday, right? <clears throat> I did, uh, we had two that were like directly over the house that just shook. It was that. Uh, but. but we're here and your home and here. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us today online. It's so glad that you are joining us today. Welcome to everybody here in person as well. Our call to worship is from the 136th Psalm. I'm going to read like three verses. So this is a, a kind of a, it is a call to worship, right? Praise be to you, Lord. So first off, this Psalm is a prayer. I'm going to use it as our opening prayer as well. Uh, it's a prayer to God, but listen to the heart of the psalmist in this prayer. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Everybody here and everybody at home behind the camera over there. How many of you um, were, were uh, either present or watched the uh, service last week at Gutter Park? Yeah, quite a few of you. And I have to thank George for asking you guys to pray for me because my country, England, was playing in the uh, championship game. And you didn't pray hard enough because we lost. Thank you. <laughs> so I knew I've, the World Cup's next year, so I've got one year to find another church that can kind of get me over the line. <laughs> So we're going to open the service with a, a song that is so old, it's even older than him. It was written by Francis of Assisi, and, and I don't know what year, but he died in 1226. And when I look at the words, I think that he must have been like bursting, bursting with like adoration for God and his glory, because he's urging the very sun, the moon, the clouds, and all the creatures of the earth to stand up and praise God. It's called All Creatures of Our God and King. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Hallelujah Hallelujah Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. 
So yeah, we're in this series called Hashtag Be the Church, which is a social media, hashtag is a social media type of symbol right now, and uh, we looked at that a few weeks ago as we were beginning a series on how to be the church, and we're going back to Acts chapter 2, the very first church it began on the day of Pentecost, so we started talking about this a while ago on Pentecost. Where, where the Holy Spirit came and filled the believers, and they went out and changed the world. They just had an impact and changed the world. And that is what Jesus calls you and I to do in this world that we live in as well. And so what is it that that church had going for it? What, is it that, what were their practices? What were their priorities? Because we, gotta, we just kind of want to do an evaluation and go, are those our priorities? Is because, man, that, that church was this close to Jesus, you know? I mean, they, they knew him, and so I got a feeling they got it right. That's all I'm saying here, and, and, I wanna, and we want to get it right, right? So let's, let's look at that and look at some of the things that they did and make sure we're on board with that. So um, we looked at the first one. Well, we talked about the heart, that this is all a matter of the heart. I'm going to keep coming back to that, no matter what. This is about loving Jesus. And so the first one was we evangelize through outreach. This is just the number one purpose. Go and make disciples. Just go and do it. As you're going, make disciples. And it's, so that's, that's from people who, who don't know Jesus yet, don't believe, and all the way up through every one of us standing here, we're still in a process, aren't we, of becoming more and more like Jesus, becoming more and more a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Right? So today I want to look at the second one that was there. And it started with our call to worship. We're to exalt God. Okay? We're to exalt God. That's worship. That's worship. So this, this, this church kept the main thing the main thing, right? And today we're going to look at exalting him through worship. The first church worshiped God. Look at these verses. Every day they continue to meet in the courts together. In, uh, they, they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They went to church, okay? Can I just put it that way? And in the next verse it says, and they, they, praised, they were praising God. That's worship. And the other thing that they did was they prayed together. That's worship. We're going to, look at, we're going to be looking at prayer because apparently, as Kevin said, we need to work on that. So. Um, <laughs> but we are going to be looking at prayer kind of separately because that's a, that is a big piece of what God is doing in, in, right now. You know, he always has, but it's, it's, it's kind of a piece I just really want us to focus on a little bit, too. So I'm going to look at that one separately, but prayer is an act of worship, but they were doing these things together, right, as the church. So what I want to do is ask the question about worship, and we're going to go to Psalm 95, just as one scripture, there were many, many, uh, and ask the question, what does worship look like? Biblically, what does biblical worship look like? So let's go to Psalm 95, and I'm going to read first. I'm going to look at the first three verses here. So read along with me. It, uh, not, you don't have to read out loud, just read along <laughs> with me. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, 
the great king above all gods. That's how the psalm starts, right? And there are some, some things in there that, that, that tell us how to worship. And so here's, here's the first thing that I want to mention this morning. Worship God properly, which means we come here on his terms, not ours, okay? On his terms. A.W. Tozer, who is a, he's a great author, great Christian theologian, and he has written just, if, if, do yourself a favor, Google A.W. Tozer, T-O-Z-E-R, quotes, and look at the, the, the quotes, the statements, the, the one-liners and things that he came up with over his many years of service to God. They are fantastic, right? But this is what he said about worship. Worship is the missing jewel of the church. Worship is the missing jewel of the church. So, I, I, more, more and more, I have to be honest with you, I, I, I have a confession. Find the, finding that uh, as, a, as your pastor, that there are some things I just have to say, otherwise I'm just not being a good pastor. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so it's, you just got to call out some things, you know, because if we don't, then we just continue doing them and we think they're okay and, and stuff like that. So in our culture, over a number of years now, but we were all, most of us here, uh, have been a part of all of that changes. The shift in, in, in the Western church has been this, would you agree that our, that our culture has become a bit more self-centered and selfish? Oh, sure. <laughs> you are and I am a part of our culture. Okay? You cannot get away from it because you don't live in a bubble. Okay? So part of it is that Jesus has got to make sure he separates out the bad things of culture from the good things. It's not all bad, right? But we have just become so in that selfishness, consumeristic in our lives. Okay? And unfortunately, that began to enter the church, where we became, and was the church was becoming more and more consumeristic. Okay? And I'll, I'll explain that. <clears throat> For worship, because this isn't, you know, we say we're going to church, you know, so one of, my, one of my deals is, no, we're going to worship. Church is a lot bigger than this, right? We do a lot more things in, in, in church than just, just worship, so I, I like to define it. So when we come to worship, though, part of what was happening within our culture is we come, and we come with this idea of, what am I going to get out of this? So when you come... To worship and say, what am I going to get out of this? Who's the focus? You, me. And it begins to get translated to our preferences. Well, I like this. I like that. And all of a sudden, God is not the center of why we're here anymore. He's peripheral. Because it has to happen the way we want it to happen. That's consumeristic. I'm here. You know, I, I will, if you ever say this to me, this is what I will say to you. You know, but so no one's ever going to say this to me again, right? But I haven't had people in our church say this. But there were people in churches all the time. Well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to. I'm just not getting fed. And my, my response to that is, there's only two types of people I know that need to be fed. Babies and invalids. Which one are you? Because see, as mature disciples, we should know how to feed ourselves. Paul talks about it all the time. You know, you're still on milk. You should be eating meat by now. You know, it's like, do you understand? But I'm coming here to be fed. That's, it's for me. Worship is not for you. Or me, it's for God. We come to give, not receive. Giving, if God gives us something, that's a wonderful byproduct. But it is not the purpose of worship. 
it, it, it's, it's in people's giving. You know, it's like, well, I'll, I'll give if I show up. It's like you went to a movie and you paid for the movie, but if you don't go to the movie, you're not going to pay them, right? That's consumeristic, right? And, and, and I think it's significant that this psalm begins not with an invitation to worship. It's a summons to worship. That's different. One simple word. Come. It's only one word, but it's a, an important word. It's a powerful word. We're being summoned into the presence of, of God, of the Almighty, to perform our acts of worship before Him. And that summons is given three times in this psalm. In verse 1, we read, come, let us sing. Then in verse 2, it says, let us come before him with thanksgiving. And finally, and I didn't read it, but later in verse 6, come, let us bow down in worship. That's a position of the heart, by the way. Worship's not something that's optional for God's people. You know, it's talked about that a, a while back where more and more people are like, worship, well, that's one option on a Sunday morning. I got to tell you, if, when you're in love with Jesus, you don't even think about it. It's not like one of many choices. It's because the attitude of the heart is, oh, I got to go do this. I can't wait to do this. It's a privilege to do this. Okay. This is something that is very specifically requested of us. It's even required of us. This summons is significant because it shows that, that we are not to worship God on our own terms, but on His. He doesn't come to us, we come to Him. So here's the thing. You take... Uh, Take a viewpoint on a lot of different views on worship, what it looks like, you know. So if you were to ask a, a Pentecostal or an Anglican or a Catholic or a Methodist or a Baptist or a younger person or an older person, you will probably come away with as many different views as the number of people you asked, what does worship look like? Okay. And I got to make this point this morning. Your take on worship is relatively irrelevant, okay? It's God's view on worship that really matters. And by the way, if you were to ask people, that group, you know, and whatever, <laughs> uh, about worship, all of the differences that we would have, most of them don't matter. Most of them are not theology, they're not like, well, the Bible says, you know. And, and I say that because there would be, a, I think, a higher degree, there would actually be a, a higher degree of what, what worship really means to God among that entire group. But it may differ greatly in the way we do that. The style of worship, we know there's a lot of different styles of worship. Some of it's cultural, some of it is traditional, some of it... But here's the thing. The good news, actually, is nowhere in Scripture does God prescribe a particular style of worship as the one correct style. There's lots of different ways to worship God, and people all over the world, we worship God in many, many different ways, but all doing the same thing, not, not the same way. There are lots of different styles with which to worship God, and they are all acceptable as long as we are doing it on God's terms. Because he doesn't dictate style, he doesn't dictate traditions, but rather he dictates attitude, he dictates heart. So what are some of the things that God dictates in worship? Okay. So here's the next one. Worship, first of all, overflows with praise. Lots of ways to praise God, but praise is always a part of worship. 
Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music in song. All of that is describing ways, reasons to praise God. So when our love and our gratitude for God fills our lives to the point where it simply overflows, that's worship. That's worship. One commentator says, the praise consists of a popular outburst of joy using all the available means of expressing love and loyalty to the Lord. All available means to express worship and love. So there's not just one way to do it right. So you know that, that, that translation, that's not even, uh, the paraphrase of the Bible uh, called The Message, it's by Eugene Peterson. Uh, he just puts it, the, the scriptures, and it's not a translation, he just puts it in everyday language to help us feel what's going on in that passage, right? He said, worship does not satisfy our hunger for God, because even that is pointing in this direction, right? Worship does not satisfy our hunger for God. It whets our appetite. I like that. Our need for God is not taken care of by engaging in worship. It deepens it. It overflows and permeates the day and the week. And when we're truly worshiping God, we are we are overflowing with this praise, whatever form it might take, it just comes out. Because that's about the heart. You come here to just love on God. Which recognizes, by the way, the next thing from this psalm, it, we come on his terms, but it recognizes God's position. God's position. Here's verse 3. For the Lord is the great God, the King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. Do you begin to see as he's describing who God is? The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form dry land. He's the creator. He's the owner. Here the psalmist is showing us that the Lord is deserving of our overflowing expression of praise to him. He is worthy of our worship and deserving of our devotion. Why? Because he is the great king. He rules and he reigns as sovereign over the entire universe. He reigns as the king above all gods and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and and we need to recognize God's supreme position and give him the honor that he deserves. There's a story of Governor Alfred Smith. So he is a New York state governor back in the early 1900s. Some of you may have met him, I don't know, but he was this... uh, So he was invited to to give a speech at a convention dinner. And he discovered when he arrived at at the convention banquet hall that the predominantly out-of-state audience, so most of them were not from New York, um, they had, and this is quoting now, I'm going to use his quote, Governor Smith's, they had a supercilious, condescending, semi-inebriated interest in him. That was what he sensed. They, th- they thought that Alfred Smith was some kind of fun joke, and his insight into what they must have been thinking about him was verified when the Toastmaster gave the governor a very flippant introduction, climaxed by the phrase, and now, boys, I give you a great guy, Al Smith. Not very formal or respectful, actually, to say the least. Now, Governor Smith... He was probably the last guy in the world to insist on idle ceremony or empty formality. But on this occasion, he sensed an affront not only to himself personally, but also to the office of governor and to his heritage. So he, he made his point very briefly. 
He said, gentlemen, when I was a little boy on the east side, my father took me to see a great civic parade. I held his hand tightly as battalion after battalion of marching infantry came by. And then suddenly my father stiffened. I almost felt a tingling pride thrilling in his being. And swiftly he said, son, take off your hat. The governor of New York is passing by. And I took off my hat. Gentlemen, the governor of New York bids you good night. And he walks out. I love that story, you know. But the illustration of that it asks the tougher question for us. Are we sometimes guilty of treating God like that in our worship? I mean, we may be able to worship in many different ways, but none of them ever have anything to do with treating God flippantly, with failing to give him proper respect. In the book of Revelation, there's an angel in, in John's revelation there. And he makes this connection. The angel makes a connection between respecting God and worship when he says this. Fear God and give him glory. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Fear God and give him glory. Not We have such a problem with that word fear because we translate it to mean in our, in our hearts and in our minds, uh, something like a little child being afraid of somebody under their bed or fearing punishment and, and all of this stuff. It's about respect God for who he is. You are, oh man, you would understand it if the presence of a holy God was here in all of his glory right now. You, you know what we, remember I talked a couple of weeks ago about the positions of worship and one was, was, was prostate, laying face on it, that's what, you, you would, you, that's what we'd be doing right now. That, that would be the natural uh, response. We, 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 you wouldn't even think about it, you would just do it. Because you're in the presence of a holy God. That's, that's, what the, that's what the psalmist is talking about, that's what the angel is talking about. And once we recognize God's position, well, guess what? We recognize our position. So to worship God means to submit to him because he is God and we are the created, not the creator. We're his possession. Jesus, you know, when he died on the cross for you, paid for your sins, you know, one of the things we read in the New Testament, you know, you were bought with a price. We're, we were bought with a price the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. Verse 6 of that Psalm 95 says this, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. And maybe you can't physically bow down or kneel, but as I said, body position is really simply reflection of the position of your heart. That's the most important thing. Well, even through the Old Testament and all, all the way, you know, God's, even, God sets up this whole system of sacrificial system, and, and, and he says, that's not, that's not what I really want. What I want is your heart. Okay, it's not just outward acts of worship. They're meaningless without this. They are. They're just going through the motions that someone taught us if, we're not, if it doesn't come from here. It says we are under his care. And so we submit. We bow down. We kneel before our God. We've, we've looked at the, the majesty of God and we have seen this high and lofty position which he holds and so our submission to this great king well, it's warranted. It's a, again, it's a matter of the heart. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? We are under God's care as the creator. And you know what? By submitting, we are then simply presenting ourselves to God 
and actually allowing him to meet our needs. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that we worship God so we can get something out of it, okay? So don't, don't misunderstand that. That, that. that attitude is foreign to genuine worship. But there's nothing wrong with recognizing that there are, in fact, benefits to worshiping God. When we submit to him, he provides for us. He cares for us. And when we refuse to submit to him, we're losing out on all the benefits of having the Lord as our shepherd. You see in that, in that verse, you know what? We are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So do you know the, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, how do <laughs> I say this? Most people, if you grew up in church, you know the 23rd Psalm. If you don't know the 23rd Psalm, it's a great psalm. Go and read it. Somebody rewrote that psalm um, with, with this idea of someone who is refusing to submit to God. Okay? I'll read it to you. The Lord is not my shepherd, because I'm not submitting, right? The Lord is not my shepherd. I lack everything. I am always on the other side of the fence looking in at the green pastures. I can never get to the quiet waters and so my soul is dry and barren. The psalmist really says he restores my soul, right? If you look at that psalm, you see the benefits of David, what he's talking about as a, as a shepherd. It's not the reason, it's, it's the result, Okay. I always take the wrong path and I get lost. Every time I go through the dark valley, I live in fear, for I am all alone. And there is no one to comfort me. I eat the crumbs underneath the table of my enemies. There is no oil for my head and my cup is always empty. Surely wickedness and hate will pursue me all the days of my life and I will be cast out of the house of the Lord. Forever. Ends quite poignantly, doesn't it? Not quite as comforting, by the way, as David's 23rd Psalm there, is it? When we refuse to submit to the Lord's care, all of the comfort is just sucked right out of the shepherd's psalm. So we submit to the Lord first and foremost because he is worthy of our worship and he is deserving of our devotion and our praise, and secondly, for the sake of our souls. Worshiping God. I I, I began by by talking a little bit about cultural Christianity. Um, Let me come back to that for just a second here. I want to just talk about the nine commandments. You know them, right? Uh, Put them up on the screen. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor your mother and father. You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, bear fault witness against your neighbor, and you shall not cover. Nine commandments. Right? We all grew up learning that there was ten. Now let's be honest. And what's what's the one that's missing then if I said nine and there's ten? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath is a, is a day of, uh, for worship and rest. God's gift to us. And if we're totally honest, how many of us have all but eliminated that from the list? At least it's not anywhere near the same category as the list of commandments that, that's left there. For instance, <clears throat> um, I've told this story before. I had gotten permission for it, so hopefully she's fine with this. <laughs> we have a, a woman that grew up in this church. Um, it's Jim and Joanne's daughter, Carrie. She's now Carrie O'Connor. Uh, and and when, my, when my two sons were born, my, my youngest was just a baby at the time, Joshua. That made, that made Joshua about three, between three and four years old. Uh, Carrie was working at the Boston Aquarium. Really cool. 
And so she invited us up there, and uh, she was working with sea lions. Have you ever been close to a sea lion? They are massive, massive animals here. And so she does the show. She's like training. This is like her dream job, okay? She's working with the sea lions, and she's like, I just love this. This is, and, it's like, and she said, now listen, you, you're, you're watching the show with everybody else, and I'm going to pick somebody to come down here. Don't worry about that, because at the end of the show, you get a private seeing here, you know? And so that's cool, you know? And so that all happens, and now, so we had to coax Joshua, by the way, because these things are massive. These things are massive. But we got to go down there, be with the sea lions, and again, she's living her dream job. And then they came to her at the aquarium and said, we need to change your hours, and you're going to have to start working on Sundays. And she quit. She left her dream job. Why? Because I'm not working on Sundays. Now I want to ask the question. Would that thought ever enter your mind? I, I've met people who go, well, they changed my job, and now I got to work. I'm not coming anymore. Without, as if somehow it's just a given. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And, and that the question doesn't even seem to enter a lot of people's minds that, that are in churches. It's not even a part of the equation. And that's the point I'm making, that that command, therefore, is meaningless. Look at uh, Bobby Nelson from our church. Um, the, uh, he, when we went through not a fan, changed his life. And by the way, I forgot to make that an announcement. So Bobby's, gonna, Bobby's away for a few weeks, so he's the one that's going to be leading that for us. So I don't have a date yet. Just be patient. We're going to do the Not a Fan series again separately as a, as a, as a, a, as a discipleship uh, opportunity. We already got like a dozen people signed up for this, and you can still do that at myambc.life. Uh, but it, God just got so much a hold of him, and he owned a, a, a business. He had three Napa auto parts stores. And what did he decide to do after that? He closed them on Sundays. People are going, what are you, nuts? Closed them on Sundays, and why? Because he wanted to worship. Not only that, he wanted to make sure I am not taking away that opportunity from any of my employees. Keep the Sabbath holy. Right? Just food for thought as we look at that that's one of the ten, okay? So how do we prepare our hearts to come into God's presence? So I, I just want to give you, this is the takeaway, right? This is things to think about for next Sunday. Right? So one of the things that I have just so appreciated about my wife um, when it comes to worship is that um, it's a priority for her, and you, you'll know when you have kids, especially getting ready for church can be sometimes a bit of a chore. Um, and in truth, I am no help for her on Sunday mornings because I'm out of there. She's basically doing this all by herself. Right? So one of the things that she has practiced from ever since I can remember she doesn't get ready for church on Sunday morning to come and worship. She does all of the prep Saturday night. I know exactly, I knew I was wearing this last night. It's hanging right next to my closet. So I get out my socks and get out my shoes Saturday night. I don't even have to think about it. Right? And if you don't know, I'm colorblind, so my wife always puts out my clothes. So otherwise, you would be laughing for other reasons at me. So it's like, <laughs> so, and if she really wanted to pull a cruel joke on me, she could, and I wouldn't even know. So, <laughs> but she doesn't, because everyone, because she knows everyone knows she puts these out there, right? Uh, my, my point is that the kids, everything, everything was ready to go. She's not waiting until Sunday morning, because you know what? That would be stressful. That would be more stress than it's already there. So can I just suggest to you if, 
Sunday mornings, getting ready is stressful. Start getting ready Saturday night. That's one way to come here or online, wherever you are, with a, with a different attitude. If, if the attitude is one of stress, frustration, distraction, what are you going to do to help eliminate that? You're going to be, this is about being intentional about coming into God's presence with the right attitude and the right heart. Now, for those of you who are here in person, when you get here, um, I know we, we love fellowshipping, we love talking. And two weeks ago in communion, that was just amazing. Everybody, you know, and I got a, we got a call. <laughs> there's, there's a real call to worship at that moment. Sit down, you know, that, that type of thing, right? But listen, when, when we get here, when, when the timer is on, the countdown, that is a good, re let that be a reminder of you, not just of the, the announcements on that countdown take about 20 seconds, right? So after you see them, close your eyes, sit down, take some time, right? And just pray for God to be honored. Do a heart check. Is Jesus the most important person to me right now? The most important thing? Worshiping him? If you're joining us online, actually you have a, I think you have a bigger challenge. It, you, know, you know, the sanctuary is conducive. It's not like you can get up and... There's sort of this protocol, isn't there? And you're in this place that we're here, and now we can get centered. It's a lot harder to do that from home. So you actually have to create an intentional space, where some place in your home where you can not watch worship, but worship. See, there's a difference between watching worship and worshiping. We want you to participate. We want you to be a part of what's going on. And in God's presence is just as much where you are as where we are because that's who God is. But you've got to be intentional. You've got to remove the distractions, right? Find a place where you're not going to get interrupted and make it a holy place. And then the same thing. Do a heart check. It's Jesus, the most important thing to me right now. And then during worship, for all of us, give, express joy, express praise, love on God, breathe. <laughs> breathe a prayer. God, maybe this is the prayer leading up to worship. God, quiet. help me to quiet my heart and hear from you. Help me to focus my wandering thoughts on you for these next moments so that you might receive and be honored by the worship I want to give you. And just let that guide you. See what happens. They're simple. Those are real simple things. Everybody else can, can do something to be more intentional about the call to come into the presence of God. That early church, man, they were praising God. That's what we're called to do. And I'll tell you, when someone walks in this place and sees and experiences authentic worship, God uses that. Helps them understand, wow, this is what it's like. And it is a glimpse of heaven. It's practice for heaven, by the way. So, Lord, as we come together, um, enlarge our hearts for you in worship. It is so critical. It means so much. It's, help us to move away from ourselves and closer to you. Convict us, God. We confess there are times where I judge worship based on what I want. God, it's really about just me giving to you. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Um, I actually, I'll just close, close with this. So when we were in uh, Missouri a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, visiting my, my son and my daughter-in-law. Uh, I don't know if I told you this, but in, in Springfield, I told some of you this, that 
Churches out there are like Dunkin' Donuts here. You know, the, the, the joke in Rhode Island is if you fall down at a Dunkin' Donuts, you get up at another one, right? <laughs> Churches were like that out there. There were so many. I mean, every, at one point, my wife apologizes to Daniel in the car. He, she, he said, she said to him, I know I keep saying this, but uh, everywhere we go, there is nothing but churches everywhere, and they are huge. So I looked from where we were staying. We, we, had, we had rented a, a, a kind of an apartment for the time we were there, and right from there, you could look out across, and here was this church, North Point. That's, that's a, an Andy Stanley-connected church, North Point Church. I said, oh, what time are their services? So we went to church twice that Sunday because I had to go to Daniel's church, of course. But I wanted to go to North Point. Um, and, and we get there, and there's bouncy houses out in the parking lot for the kids' programs and everything else, huge sanctuaries. Springfield's not that far from Branson, Missouri, kind of like Nashville-ish. It's becoming a growing thing. Uh, so we were in worship, and... Kind of country-ish music. I got to be honest with you. I hate country music. I got to tell you. <laughs> and it was like, really, you know. But what a great message! What a great group of people. That didn't prevent me from worshiping. That was is my point here, right? Even though, nah, not my not my taste, not my flavor. But what a great service it was. It was wonderful. I just forgot that illustration to just say, yeah, you know, I get it, you know. Anyway, uh, I'm going to close and uh, with a with a song, uh, kids. I apologize. I do not have a children's sermon for you today. Um, I did not realize my half my face over here was going to be covered with some gauze and a bandage, and I didn't get one done because this is the first time this morning that I actually just to get a, put a bandaid on my nose. So uh, I looked a wreck. So I didn't really. You know, needed to look good for the children's time. So, guys, uh, close us out in a wonderful song of worship, please. I thought I was the only one that didn't like country music. Thank you, George. Uh-huh. And and how Solidarity, many of, how many man. of you Solidarity. would like how many of you would like a bouncy house to, before you came into worship? That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Something you should think about. So, so I I love I love songs that tell a story. Uh, in fact. I remember the other day I was saying to Becky, my wife, Becky, I love songs that tell stories. And she said, that's very nice, dear. She patted me on the head and she sent me off to bed with a cup of hot cocoa. So, but this, this song perfectly tells the story in four verses of how Jesus came down from heaven, how he lived with us, how he died on a cross for us, and, and how, because of that, we can be res- resurrected. It's called, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery.
just hopefully it's God um, sit down <laughs> I need to make a caveat here uh, sometimes you hear me say don't hear what I didn't say except you could have heard something I didn't say because I didn't say it so <laughs> I didn't say go out and quit your jobs if you work on a Sunday uh, I was a lifeguard for six years, which is probably why I'm having to have, um, I've had numerous of these types of skin cancer surgeries. You know, what I, you know what though? People actually drown on Sundays. They can, right? Uh, we have nurses, we have, there are professions that are healthcare, all, all of that stuff. So I, I wasn't, I'm just not suggesting, I'm saying pray, ask the question. Don't, don't be flippant about those decisions. So I just had to say that because recognize that it all ties into part of my, my history here, but don't hear what I wasn't saying. Go in peace, in turmoil, whatever it is that you leave with this morning. Amen.